So welcome everyone. This is the Michigan Sarah Erase conversation peer to peer. So we're so glad you are with us today. So today we're just going to give a quick update on ERAP2, which is the Emergency Rental Assistance Program funding from Treasury. Um, and we have a guest speaker today, Stacey Lauren, who's going to talk a lot about workflows and data. And then hopefully we're going to have some good conversation, questions, comments, thoughts that you have. I'm going to take a look forward and talk about future um, dates and topics and requests that you have maybe for future discussions amongst this group or webinars that you might want to see. And we have a relatively small group today, so I'm, we're going to be really informal and hopefully have time for you to talk and not me. So I'm looking forward to that. I also want to say hello, um, our fabulous Erase intern, Micah intern, Lucy Gill is on and she is doing the slides and sharing her screen. So thank you, Lucy. All right, so let's go into the next slide, please. And as many of you saw that um, Michigan overall for the second tranche or tranche, however you want to pronounce it, of funding from Treasury to the state of Michigan was appropriated um, initially by Treasury um, back several months ago, and the Michigan legislature did not take action on it. So last week, in a supplemental bill, budget bill, uh, the legislature appropriated $140 million of the $523 million total. As you may have seen in the communications from MISTA, some additional criteria was added um, to this particular you know, tranche of funding versus the ERA or ERAP one funding. So um, some of you are familiar with some of the um, requirements about, you know, um, getting folks getting IDs and providing proof of income from the EDP program. And I know that um, MISTA will be providing a lot more detail tomorrow. There was a webinar that MISTA is hosting tomorrow at, two, at 9, 9 a.m. So hopefully um, you'll all be able to be on there. And this tranche of funding is expected to be spent down by March. Yesterday, I was on a call for the um, Interagency Council on Homelessness with Kelly Rose. And Kelly Rose said, you know, if you had asked me two years ago if $1 billion would have been enough, you know, rental assistance, um, you know, during the pandemic, she would have said yes. But now, you know, we know it's really not enough. We still continue to see demand. So it's, it's, pretty, it's, it's um, concerning. So we know you guys are all working hard and getting lots of um, demand. Um, and so Mark, Maggie, you weren't clear whether I do. So I'm going to um, let Mishta cover that tomorrow. They have, um, sent out guidance which details like all the new requirements yeah if that's okay i'm going to let them be the experts on that um and i know they sent out new guidance and you know um highlighted the new things so that will definitely be a topic tomorrow um so yes lucy you can go on to the next slide and we will get on with our speaker for today so i'm so excited to introduce stacy lauren who is the Sarah Program Director at Community Housing Network. And she has been with Community Housing Network in Oakland County, I want to say two and a half years. I had the privilege of hiring her after um, I shortly joined them three years ago, previously. I'm not with them any longer, of course. But she had previous experience working as a landlord engagement specialist. So that was perfect kind of... Uh, experience for doing this work and now she's a Sarah program director so I will turn it over to Stacy. Thank you Lisa. Yeah thank you for thank you for hiring me two and a half years ago about that. <laughs> All right so I um, am going to talk a little bit today about um, what we're doing 
um, in the SARA department at the Community Housing Network as it relates to uh, workflows, um, an internal database that we um, build and utilize, and then also um, our data and compliance team and kind of the structure of this data compliance admin component that we have at CHN that kind of supports um, these the workflows and our internal database, these initiatives that we have. So um, we created uh, what we call a SARA manual, which is kind of like an all-encompassing document. It contains uh, vital contacts, both internal and external, to help our SARA specialists, aka our case managers, um, you know, work their cases and, and um, get assistance out to the community. But we have call, call scripts, we have email um, scripts, um, everything to support them in doing their case management. We have case management standards, like contact standards, how often we expect people to be followed up and called and um, notes put into the mission portal, things of that nature. Uh, we have a application process overview. You know, there are a lot of a lot of steps and documents to complete, um, even in a even in a low barriers program. Uh, so we have that documented too, um, both in workflows to for each process, uh, and also like in a visual flow chart as well. Um, so we when we um, have new staff um, come on, we use that kind of as our central training document and tool, and then update that, of course, um, accordingly. So it gets updated quite a bit. So it stays um, very up to date with the MISHTA guidance. So can we have workflows that we create for each step in the application process? So again, if you visualize like a kind of flow chart from start to finish from when an application is assigned to um, a, a CERA specialist all the way to um, CHN mailing that checkout to the participant or to the landlord, um, we have pretty much a then documented <laughs> process along the way. So um, we have it set up to where you can actually click within that document and it'll take you right to that workflow. So it's kind of an interactive document as well. Um, so it, you know, it's easy to maneuver. So you don't have to go to a lot of different places to find the information. So again, that'll start from, you know, your introductory call with a tenant all the way to um, landlord called me and you know, hasn't received a check, what do I do? And everything along the way, eligibility and, and all that. Um, so we thought that this was important to create because it makes the information accessible, um, especially when working in a virtual environment and training in, an, in a virtual environment. Um, I'd say like, you know, training staff to complete SARA applications has been um, extremely uh, labor intensive task, especially doing it virtually. So we just found creating these extra, extra tools for support have been very valuable um, to ensure accuracy and consistency across our department as well. Um, we go, we fluctuate from having 40 to 50 SARA case managers. I'm sorry, that's the whole department, not 40 to 50, <laughs> 20 to 30 SARA case managers at a time. So um, you can imagine keeping everyone you know, virtually um, consistent, accurate, um, it, you know, we, we utilize these tools a great deal. Um, and so kind of going back to the database piece. So we created an internal database so we could start working on Sarah prior to the portal being um, up and running. So um, the database is a, you know, tool that we use for both case management and for tracking, um, you know, payments and, and all the assistance payments that we make. So when we set that up, we use that probably for, I don't know, I think maybe the first month until the um, MISHTA portal was up and running. And then we just transferred all of that data into the portal. Um, but then we still have this database set up to where we could track again, all of our payments. So we have like real time, uh, we can get at any moment, like real time, like what we spent on our financial assistance. Um, also, what AMIs we've paid out, so we can track our AMIs, we can track what zip codes we're primarily paying out, um, how many households we've served, um, all, that, all that information um, we have um, available to us. And we utilize a financial request document to put that information in, in there. So this is a document that kind of works as the intermediary between the portal and that um, database. So that's how we transfer that information. Okay, so, um, and then also the last thing I'll say, just that weekly Sarah dashboard on there. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Um, we, I sent out a weekly Sarah dashboard to our executive leadership every week um, that outlines what we spent that week, our approved cases. We track our average approved cases um, every week, um, how many applications were submitted and how many are in each of the corresponding statuses in the portal. And also now since we have the recertification piece, 
um, we also track that. So we also have that um, that Sarah dashboard weekly from the start of the program till now. So we have you know been tracking that data over time. Thank you. Okay, so how like how all this works, right? Because it, there are a lot of moving parts, and it takes a team to do it. And so we have a data and compliance team. It's about, um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five people, four and a half. Um, well, there's one part-time employee um, that kind of manages all of this. We have a data and administrative manager and some of their primary tasks are to manage the team and manage the internal database. So make sure that, you know, all the information is accurate, up to date, you know, duplicates are removed. So we, you know, um, do monthly kind of audits of that data to make sure that it is accurate and up to date. Um, they complete the weekly payment event in the MISHTA portal and they reconcile the portal against our internal database. So when we do our um, weekly payment events in the MISHTA portal, we look at those payments versus what we have in our internal database and make sure that those match. Okay. Um, and then the um, data administrative manager also serves as a liaison to our accounting department because of the, the volume of, you know, of um, checks that need to be processed and sent out, we have to have a dedicated person in our department um, that can manage all of that. Because again, we get a lot of, receive a lot of requests from landlords or from tenants about payments and, and you know, and when they've received them, if they've gone out, checks being cashed, things of that nature. So we have one central um, point person for that. Okay. And then under that, um, you know, data administrative manager, we have a data and administrative specialist. And that data administrative specialist manages all of our paper application uploads. So we have a Dropbox outside of our office. Um, that's where we see the most of, bulk of our paper applications come in. Um, some might be mailed through the mail. And um, those three times a week, those applications are manually uploaded into the SARA portal um, by the data administrative specialist. And uh, they also, the data administrative specialist also ensures accuracy on the financial request prior to submitted to accounting. So again, that financial request document that serves as our um, connection between the MISHTA portal and our internal database is also the document that we submit to our accounting department to um, request funding or payment to be sent um, to that landlord or tenant. So um, it's a crucial document in our process. And then they manage, they manage that. Right? And they also reconcile our general ledger against our internal database. So we know we have three places where we're managing payments, right? The MISHTA portal, um, our internal database, and our general ledger. And so all of that gets reconciled. Thank you. Okay, um, so two more, two more things and I'm done talking. <laughs> uh, we also have two compliance and administrative specialists and some of their main tasks are they do um, a, random audit of 5% of our approved and denied cases monthly. And we use the um, MISHDA um, monitoring checklist, compliance monitoring checklist. Um, that's what we use to audit these cases again. So every month we pull 5% randomly and then we put it through this, um, this compliance checklist. Um, they also audit all of our tenant pay cases that are over $20,000 and all of our cases over $25,000. And they also um, manage our department workflows. So all the workflows that I mentioned before that are kind of embedded into our SARA manual and otherwise um, our compliance and administrative specialists are in charge of updating. So they stay very much on top of our, um, of the MISHTA guidance and all the updates that we have and update all those documents accordingly. Okay. And finally, we have a case administrator and our case administrator um, works as our um, assigner um, for our SARA specialists to you know, assign out applications accordingly of course, based on eviction status, um, based on date of application, um, and for our, our recertifications based on the date of the approved initial research, or approved initial application. Um, and our Sarah, and I'm sorry, our case administrator also works as a court liaison. So working with court systems as far as dockets and assigning urgent cases. Um, so that is our data and compliance team who supports all of our workflows, our data tracking and is you know, makes it all possible for us. Thank you, Stacey. <laughs> You're welcome. That was great in a very encapsulated nutshell. So I wonder if anyone has any questions. I do have a couple that I thought of while you were talking, but I'll see if anybody wants to either unmute themselves or put them in chat. I 
did want to say while we we're waiting too, we did a court um, webinar last week. We had uh, two judges, one of them Judge Johnson from the 46th, and she had high praise for Caitlin, who's the uh, SARE administrator, the, the liaison with the court. She does, uh, they send their dockets in a week ahead of time and she goes through and updates the status of every single um, tenant who's scheduled for a docket in the coming week. So it's a lot of work, but it's really, I think something that really kind of smoothed the process because Southfield has a very high volume uh, court. And so it really helped, you know, calling and asking and the court wasn't able to get you know, uh, portal access. So it was something that really helped streamline the process. All right, you have some questions. Um, Michelle LaJoy is asking, are your workflows available to share? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I wherever I can share them, absolutely. Um, you can either, yeah, send them to me or you, if you want to reply. I don't know if it'll work to reply all to the email. So you can send them to me okay. if you want. Um, Maggie says we are having and we have an overwhelming amount of paper applications. How do you handle those with a remote team? Yeah, so again, we have like the one dedicated staff person, which is a lot of what a lot of what they do um, three days a week, which, you know, we've seen. I mean, it fluctuates from week to week um, and it is it is definitely a um, very time consuming task. Um, but, you know, one that I believe it's 10 days. That Misha wants the paper application uploaded. So forgive me if that if that is inaccurate, but I believe it's within ten days. So yeah, we just have a dedicated staff person that that does it. Yeah, just taking the time to do it. When we first started, when Sarah first started, we were using those to assign, you know, and like we would have the Sarah specialists upload them themselves. But um, you know, it just it, with doing that and working the cases, it just took too much time. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Ricky's saying our agency is much smaller. Any tips on how to scale your process down? Yeah, so um, I think that probably, you know, where it could be shaved off is, I mean, we want to, one thing that's important is thinking about how we separate tasks so we have more internal control. Um, and that's, you know, especially with, um, you know, a program like this where um, we're paying tenants and such large dollar amounts. So being able to have kind of the checks and balances across. Um, but I think that the, you know, certainly, um, you know, a manager may not be required if you don't have, you know, five staff people that they have to manage. Um, and I think that probably someone who's, I think about someone who's uploading a document and, you know, could they, like, are they the appropriate person to do, you know, compliance, um, you know, because they're just uploading the information, they haven't contacted anyone through it. So like that might be something in my mind that they could also do, but probably a person who's, you know, monitoring um, the payments and double checking the payments might not be the appropriate person to also do the compliance because that might be, you know, a little bit more in conflict. So I would kind of think about it that way. At what points are they touching the applications and how, you know, someone could do dual roles without it being a conflict of interest. Wonderful. Yeah. At one point early in the early days of EDP, we had our uh, kind of our receptionist taking the applications from the mail and scanning them in. And mm -hmm. I know uh, the volume got to be too much. And, you know, mm -hmm. I know some agencies are working 100 percent virtually. Um, so, you know, things have to change. But good point about separating the duties and kind of having those checks and balances. Mm -hmm. So Kelsey is asking, are you able to share any of the work, workflow charts or parts of the manual? I'm sorry, could you repeat that, Lisa? It, are you able to share any of the workflow charts or parts of the manual? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm happy to send to send that information along. Yeah, I'm happy to send that to Lisa and then you could, you know, share it with, you know, share it with, um, you know, everyone who's attended today. Absolutely. So is it virtual? It's a online internally for the staff to access and then you yeah. have to update it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all stored just on our like on our um on our drive, you know, on our CHN drive. Um but you know it's not it, there's not any personal tenant information or anything in it right. that you know I would feel you know uncomfortable with sharing. Um you know I can absolutely send it. They're all within PDFs. Now the thing that I will say like when the, like I was talking about how everything, like the things are connected, we like that might be lost. <laughs> like when I share it, because that place where it lives, you know, you wouldn't have access to, or, you know, isn't on that the same, um, 
you know, I don't really know. I don't do that. Right. I have a team like they, like, that's like, like that. I didn't do, I can't take credit for that, but um, so yeah, I'm happy to share that, but those, those things might be lost. Yep. Um, I just, as you were talking about like, you know, the database and tracking, looking at the AMI data and the um, zip code data. So what do you do with that information um, in terms of looking at who's applying, who's in need, like, how do you, does that change your practices or you think, oh, we need to do more outreach in this area or what do you do with that? Yeah, I think that's that's definitely one of the one of the big points. That's one thing we're doing now um, in preparation for SHARE2 is, you know, like looking at the majority of the zip codes that we've served, you know, like, are there any zip codes that, you know, that might have been missed, right, where we did maybe some small, um, you know, smaller, more rural cities that, you know, didn't get the outreach um, and, you know, some things that were missed or also maybe some places that maybe would have been a little bit of a surprise. So just looking at, you know, the data from those zip codes and seeing what it tells us. Um, you know, another another thing is the, you know, again, tracking the AMIs. Is that something that we were asked to do initially in Sarah, having a portion of, you know, of a certain portion of the program being, you know, reserved for certain AMI levels. So just making sure that we're in compliance with that. Um, I was actually just asked to, you know, ask what the percentage is, what our percentage of tenant payouts are. So that's something that we can easily um, achieve from our database. I don't know how I would um, get that data from the portal. Not that I couldn't, but um, I know it's a lot easier for me to get it from our, our database. Um, it's also how I can track our weekly numbers. Again, knowing um, like the amount of money we've spent very quickly, as opposed to waiting for it all to kind of pass through our accounting department and go through our general ledger. So I think it's helped us make um, fast, real-time data-driven decisions in the community. Right. And I, you know, going along with that, I was just wondering, like, you talked about the performance data and the dashboard that you, and then you send like a weekly report to executives. So, you know, have you pivoted based on, you know, seeing your performance or do you need to like move staff around or how has that changed your implementation? Well, definitely it lets us know about staffing levels, you know, like we do see like, you know, do, you know, do we need more, less, right? It helps, it helps us identify like our staffing levels. Um, it also helps us make projections on our spending based on like our average number of cases and then how, like our average payout per case, right? So then that like allows us to have like better projections to meet our goals. Great. Um, the dual D says that would be helpful to have more training tools or even refreshers for team members to refer to. Remote training can use as many assets as possible. Do you want to talk at all about um, how you're doing remote training with folks, with staff? Because I know you're all 100% remote. Yeah, sure. It's, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's so difficult. And I honestly, like, I just am so empathetic for the people that sign up for this and want to, like, want to go through it. Like, 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 I just, I couldn't imagine learning this all from scratch. And, you know, and I, you know, I mean, I guess we did with EDP too, but, um, you know, this, it's, it's quite a bit. So we have, um, we found that it takes us about a good six weeks to get someone up and running. Um, and that's, you know, the, that the time frame. Um, we have a program manager that uh, works one on one with the new with our new staff. We try and hire people in groups. So anywhere from two to four um, is kind of, you know, what we look for. Anything over four is too many. Three, I think, is probably a good sweet spot. But um, we try and hire people in groups so they can go through it all together and then also kind of like create, um, you know, some, you know, maybe like <laughs> um, connections, you know, so you're not just remote, you don't know anyone who started with this kind of training group. So, um, and we just kind of go from, you know, top to bottom with, again, kind of utilizing the, the workflows and the kind of flow chart. So kind of going through each steps, give them like, you know, assign them each like maybe two cases and we just kind of go through all of them together, um, step by step. So at the end of it, they, you know, have a case that's done and, and you know, we use like a real actual case to do it with. Um, and so that's about two weeks. So we usually have about two weeks of the program manager working directly with um, the new staff. And then after that, um, they kind of graduate, so to speak, onto their team. So we have a couple of different, right now we have four um, Sarah supervisors 
and they all have teams of anywhere from three to six, which just has kind of fluctuated with, um, you know, employees, employment changing. So, um, yeah, then they kind of graduate on those teams and then their supervisor will work, you know, closer with them, you know, and having, you know, check-ins more periodically to make sure that there's, you know, still moving forward and, and um, getting up to speed. And I will say to, you know, CHN is a larger organization, but this has definitely evolved over time from the days of EDP to the initial SARA program and just, you know, CHN um, had a housing resource center, so they had a call center. So with the second iteration with SARA funding, uh, the call center kind of got kind of uh, replicated a new one into the SARA department. So you operate a call center as well. Within SARA, you don't personally, but I mean, one of your staff does, right? Mm -hmm. And so yeah. um, they've had workflow, so it was, kind of a natural progression to really talk about each of the functions and, and do workflows for all of the processes because there's a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. And with and with how much this program has changed to over the past year with, you know, it felt like there was a good amount of time where every single week there was like a major change in the program. Um so, you know, documenting it um, you know, is I mean, it was really the best. Especially, you know, if you have a caseload and, you know, there's no way someone can remember all that information, right? There's absolutely no way, so. Exactly. So more questions have come in. Rochelle is asking, how long does it take your staff to typically take the client from submission to completed case? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think that it, you know, really depends on, it really depends on the situation. I mean, I think that we, like, we definitely have staff that can, you know, if it's an urgent case, that we can do it in a day, you know, two days, a day. It really, if we have you know, everything. If we have everything, yeah. Well, I mean, and there's so much we can do, for, well, now with Sarah One, which that will be changing. And there's so much we can do with like the self-attestation. And especially if someone's in the court case, like we, we definitely utilize that. If someone is at high risk of eviction, if they are, you know, their third court case, they're, you know, have a judgment, there's like, they, like we really, really utilize um, the like self-attestation. Um, pieces that the programs offered to us. And again, like we feel confident that because we have such a great relationship with the court system and also with like, with like Shirley Blade. Great. So, but I mean, otherwise, you know, we see some that, you know, that, you know, take a little bit longer, but, and, you know, and people move at different, and like, you know, we also understand that people move at different paces, right? Like not every Sarah specialist is going to be as, you know, is going to move as fast. And that is, that's fine. You know, we do have goals, but we do know that we also have staff that care deeply about supporting the community and getting this assistance out. So, you know, it's, you know, someone might be on the phone for 30 minutes with a, <laughs> with a tenant, you know, really relating to them and comforting them where someone else might be, you know, zipping through things. So um, it really varies. Yeah. Point well taken. Mm -hmm. Um, so Maggie's asking, are any of your case managers involved with ESGCV? And then the follow-up question, how are you working with the HARA for homeless applicants? Um, well, we have, so, um, we are the HARA, so it's been, um, I guess probably a little bit easier for us. Um, so what I have, um, I have been myself managing all of the, um, homeless individuals that have, you know, that have, um, applied for Sarah or that have, you know, been referred to us or come across um, my desk. And we have worked with getting them into a hotel if they qualify for Sarah hoteling. Uh, and I have a um, individual in our call center who um, used to work in our housing resource center who would, you know, do all these screenings. So they're trained in that. So they're kind of cross-trained in both, um, both like general screening and with Sarah and they manage, they manage that. So they, do all the screening and then they, you know, connect back with me. I'm actually um, just wrapping up training a staff member, just one dedicated staff member um, to managing it all. And then they kind of refer back to them. And then, you know, we discuss the, you know, the appropriate, the appropriate way to move forward if it's with Sarah funding or with um, ESG. Right. So just a lot of internal collab, this uh, internal, you know, systems and collaborations. Right. And um, CHN is one of the organizations that receives ESG CV. However, it, it's a different department, correct? Yes, correct. Absolutely. Yeah. So we, yeah, we work across those departments. So 
Um, and then for the county, we take those referrals, like those are email, like we just have like, they're just an email to us. And then we, you know, we kind of work as the intermediary to get those um, folks screened and then that information back to um, our partner agencies. So then they know like, you know, the best course of direction, just to, you know, like that's kind of one of the issues that we've run into. I don't want to say issue, that's not the right word, but just, you know, strategy, like what's the best what's the best long-term housing success for some of the individuals that have applied for Sarah and what other programs might be a better fit for them. Yeah. And do you still have the monthly um, work group that the partners or do you just do just for Sarah? Yeah. Sarah partners, Sarah open funding partners meet weekly. Yeah. And I'd say like, I think that that's been one of our biggest keys to success throughout this entire process. Yeah, is the is the great communication and collaboration with our community partners? Absolutely. Yeah, there's two other um, sub grantees as well as CHN, and then the their collaborative applicant COC um, organization called uh, the Alliance for Housing is the fiduciary, and so everybody gets together. And then we were doing, you know, like Oakland County also has a rental assistance program, so we would communicate with them I'm sure you're still doing that to see who, yep. who fits better with which program mm -hmm. yeah Oakland County our Oakland County meeting has merged to a uh, um kind of like yeah Ports Lakeshore you know Oakland County all that together yeah good and then also May was asking what is your average caseload I'm assuming for staff Case 25 25 All right. Any other questions for Stacy? Or do people, I mean, you you had made the comment about not using the portal as much because you have your own database, which you know you're more familiar with. You were familiar with that, you know, that software or that mm -hmm. database. Mm -hmm. And our landlord yeah. stuff in there. So we just mm -hmm. used it for Sarah because it was so great to have. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's you know, and I, like I said, I'm sh like there are, you know, there, we certainly utilize the portal for, I mean, all of our app, like um, data as it relates to like applications and, yeah. you know, like things that we wouldn't be able to, you know, track it, that we wouldn't be able to track. Uh, we certainly use that too. We use both. Um, but then the other piece of information that, and I guess that's like my old landlord engagement hat, uh, which we're able to utilize in our database, which is that landlord information, landlords that worked with us in in Sarah, so we can, you know, try and strengthen those relationships with future programs. Great. Anything else? Anything you said? Oh, I forgot to mention that. Or any? Any help? Yeah. I don't. No, nothing that nothing that comes, you know, that comes to mind. Um, I'm excited for next year and to see what Sarah two brings. Great. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Stacy. Please stay on. There might be questions coming forward. You can. Thank you. So does anyone just as a follow up, is anyone out there that's on the call um, using the portal for looking at, you know, how you're doing or looking at, um, you know, time processing time or anything like that in terms of your implementation of Sarah? And while people are hopefully writing, typing in the chat, I would also ask if anybody's been looking at the dashboards. Has anybody crunched, you know, sliced and diced the dashboard for um, their community? And anybody has any insights to share there? That would be great. I don't see anything right now. So I will also ask. If people have any questions or comments, oh, here, Michelle. Um, oh, Michelle provides the data to county commissioners. Um, Daniel's saying, Holy Cross meets every Thursday to touch base on our dashboard progress. It has been helpful to see how we've been helping. Great. Great. This is such a, you know, a great iteration from, you know, the information that we had for EDP with this. Um, it's really been. Wonderful to have that more robust information. 
Michelle is saying, oh, central 10 counties, try, try and imagine doing Sarah across 10 counties. Meets every Monday at 3 p.m. Michelle, do you want to talk a little bit about what you guys talk about when you get together and what do you look at and kind of how you divided up the work and maybe the money, if you don't mind? No, not at all. Um, <laughs> not on camera here. Thank you. <laughs> um, it took a while. EDP was a struggle for us, okay? Um, but then we went to Sarah and working with our other community action agency partners um, in the UP, I think we finally have a nice workflow. Um, so our agency does Elder Marquette, Baraga, Houghton, Keweenaw, um, Dickinson, um, and Iron County is one community action agency. Menominee Delta Schoolcraft is another um, that um, we work with. And how we divvy up the money is that we do advances to our subcontracts um, or grantees so that they're um, writing the checks from their own agency for the clients that they're working with. And then we, every Monday, we have kind of a, an agenda. We um, bring up what is um, new with the guidance, what problems um, we need to help each other through situation scenarios. Um, we do have um, legal aid part of our discussion. So Ken Pinocchi does bring up um, anything that's happening in um, legal aid. And if, since he's part of multiple regions, he can um, give us additional information if we haven't heard something. We do have the court um, systems part of our 10 county. Okay, so they receive all of our updates and they um, give some feedback, what's working, what's not. We have um, the local DHS offices as part of our um, dialogue too. So we just go through each county, see what's working and um, see if we can help each other. And we've sent a lot of um, questions or scenarios to Peggy to see if she can help us out if we can't talk them through. I'm sure you're not the only one. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I know she's got a high volume and thank you, Michelle, for sharing. So for those of you that didn't get the clue, Michelle is in the EP and you know, some, cities and towns, but a lot of rural areas and in between and a lot of distance. So it's great to hear. I know you guys collaborate like crazy all the time. So it's really great to hear. Um, so in the chat, May saying that one surprise that they have is that their breakdown by race is more in line with our homeless population than with, with the general population. Large racial disparity is present. I, I was noticing that personally, when the dashboard first came out, I was, you know, checking it out. And I personally live in Oakland County. So I was looking at Oakland County and the overall. Um, Morgan's saying they're seeing the same in Washington. And I think, you know, sadly, we've, you know, seen that in the homeless population. You know, people of color are way overrepresented, um, you know, I think. Um, than the general population in the homeless population. And also, sadly, you know, with health disparities with COVID, um, people of color are more likely to get ill, have poor health outcomes, um, not as much um, access to healthcare and vaccines, as well as, you know, um, evictions and, um, you know, needing the rental assistance. So definitely see that as well. Other thoughts or comments from folks, or does anyone want to talk about how they're coordinating in their community? Any tips or tricks that you are using? This is a great time to take advantage of what we used to call when I was at CSH, hive mind. Hive mind, you know, we're all bees doing the same kind of thing. We've got everyone together. So this is the chance to ask the questions and or share your great innovation with everyone. Give it a minute to see if anyone has anything else they want to say. Maggie's saying they're using the Truth Racial Healing and Transformation Organization to help provide outreach in the county. Oh, it's been very helpful. Wonderful. I am not familiar with them. Um, where are they? Are they a Michigan organization? Are they out state? Or you can unmute yourself too, Maggie, so you don't have to. So you don't have to type all those chats. 
Um, they are actually um, a national organization, have chapters in several different locations. Um, they were originally funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Oh, yes. So Battle Creek is one of the first chapters, I guess, that they had. Um, and so we've been using them with some great success to reach some of our um, areas that historically have not been communicated to very well. So they also provided uh, translators um, to, to help out and interpreters um, for our um, Hispanic community um, who were struggling a little bit with the whole process. Wonderful. Well, thank you. That's great to hear. Anybody else have any thoughts or comments that you'd like to share? I'm gonna write that down. I wanna look them up. Cause I know a lot of organizations are looking to do DEI work as well. And um, it's hard to find organizations that have a lot of experience in that space. And also, have the capacity to take on because I know a lot of people are looking to do that work. Thank you. All right, um, if we don't have anything else, and I did wanna see uh, circle back. I know some of you are on that may have the answer to the question that was asked earlier about IDs, if expired IDs can be um, still accepted. I. Um, I know I saw the guidance, but I don't want to rely on my memory. Okay, the guidance says they will be. Thank you. Thank you. And I urge you to go on the webinar tomorrow with Mishta. You'll get all the up-to-date information and, um, and other, okay, yeah. Um, I know they are um, reserving some time at the end for questions that haven't been answered, so. All right, Lucy, maybe we can go to the next slide. I want to talk about what's coming up. And, you know, I really would love to hear from you. So first of all, um, I have scheduled the peer-to-peers. I think I have seven scheduled through June. Our ERASE grant, which is N, um, not N. Well, anyway, it stands for, uh, you know, end of evictions. and um, trying to help get rental assistance and, and work with all the SARE administrators around the state. We're part of a national cohort with National Low Income Housing Coalition and, and rental arrearages. Um, we have the grant through July, so we will be doing this work with you. Um, but I did wanna say we have one scheduled for the next peer to peer, which is January 18th. And I've scheduled the next seven to be that same um, third Tuesday of the month at 1.30. Um, we have the next discussion slated to be staffing considerations for Sarah. So kind of how do you do it in a remote environment? How do you hire staff? How do you train staff? And I know Stacy talked a lot about how they're doing it. We have Courtney, Courtney Hirely from Wayne Metro in um, Wayne County. And she's going to talk about that. She had some great comments on one of our other calls. If you have anything that you would like to hear about or you would like to talk about an innovation that you've implemented in your community with your partners, um, you can go back to the next um, one more thing. Yeah, um, we'd love to schedule you for that series. And then also um, we have tentatively scheduled the next webinar for January 26th. And we thought we would love to talk about outreach and interacting with landlords and include some community examples. So if you have some great things that you are doing with your landlords, we would love to feature you and, and have you either talk or if you don't wanna talk, you can you know just share your slides and I can go through them um, or one of your staff wanna share. We'd love to have you. This is the time for everyone to really be um, sharing what they're doing and um, talking about all the great things because I know there's a lot. All right, uh, Lucy, um, is the MISTA meeting open to anyone? I believe so. 
Um, and I don't know, um, I don't have the link handy. I think Peggy's on or she was, maybe um, people can put the, it was in the update that uh, Kelly Rose sent out. And I think there was another subsequent um, email that was sent. No, I don't think Peggy's on anymore. I am here, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, so the meeting tomorrow, it's um, open to everyone as far as Sarah partners. Um, so agencies, legal services, um, but not, not, not outside of that. Um, it's intended for the, the agencies that are directly involved in the program. Thank you, Peggy. Within the mm -hmm. Sarah family. So, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Heather yeah. posted it in the chat, so thank you for that. Thanks, all you. Yep. Perfect, guys. Thank you. Perfect. So we're looking for other ideas for topics. Um, yeah, you're a sub sub recipient. You'd be eligible to attend. Yes. You're administering the money. Yep. Absolutely. Um. Really need your feedback because I, I can come up with things, but I want to make sure it's responsive to things, you know, if you have any barriers, any challenges, or um, like I said, if you have any innovations or best practices that you would like to talk about, we would like to feature you. Even just, you know, the small things about uh, we were having challenges, so we got an organization to help us with translation and help us you know, do some outreach. So um, we really want to keep that going because I know that you guys are just, you're just killing it with all your great innovations. So glad this has been helpful. Um, so if you don't wanna put it in the chat, um, you can email me and we can go to the next slide. My email is up. Oh, sorry, there's my email, but I did wanna go, reminded me, I forgot Lucy. Um, so we featured this postcard before. This is something that um, one of our staff had put together based on some information that we, and thank you, Lucy shared it in the chat. This was um, in Canva, so here's the link to it. Um, based on some research that had been done in Denver, Colorado around messages that really resonate to people, um, I think one of the messages had said, are you behind on your rent? And, you know, research had shown that saying, you know, are you struggling to pay your rent was more impactful and got a better response. And again, the message that you are not alone. We have, you know, funds to help you. So this was, you know, proven to be more effective in terms of messaging. So we've created this template. You can um, grab it. You can click on the link and, and then customize it for your organization. You can put, if you have a website, if you have a phone number, you can put that on the bottom and, and take it and use it or redo it however you want, um, you know, with your local contact. But um, this, and, you know, it might be time to refresh the messaging, you know, uh, you know, months into the program just because there are people that we know are still in need and this, you know, this message might resonate with them. So thank you for sharing that, Lucy. So please um, also know that we are putting together more information. Uh, we have a highlight sheet coming out that um, Lucy's been working on that talks about outreach and um, we have more uh, in the works and love to hear from you. So here's my email. If you have any other ideas or suggestions, we really want to make this time effective and, and useful for you. So I want to thank you for attending. We're going to give you 10 minutes back in your day. And happy holidays to all, happy and healthy. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>